Okay, so now we want to make sure that Postgres is actually running on our machine and we can actually go ahead and manually create this database and this user um, from the command line. Now I'm on OSX and I used Homebrew to install Postgres on this machine. Um, and so we can check it out here if we brew services start PostgreSQL. You can see that the PostgreSQL server is already started. If you're on Windows, you can use the PostgreSQL uh, one-click installer and install PostgreSQL as a Windows service. That should walk you through an installation process and if at any point it asks you for what port you'd like to use, if it doesn't specify a default port, um, in general Postgres uh, runs on 5432 by default and that's what it will be running on here um, throughout this series on my development machine as well. If, if anyone has any trouble setting up Postgres on Windows or Linux, I'd be happy to make a follow-up video um, to sort of augment uh, this introduction just so that, um, just to make sure everyone has the, the basic services that were, will be required here set up. So leave, leave comments or questions below if you have any trouble with that. Otherwise, we should be able to get into the Postgres um, command line prompt here just by using uh, psql. And you can see that um, user Wes here. And we can now run um, raw commands uh, against the server um, that we're actually connected to here. And so what I'm going to do now is run a create database command to create that archdb underscore dev database that we specified in our um, connection string here. So what we type in here should match this database name. And we need to make sure to end this with a semicolon. If that um, works, we should get the output create database as a response. And then what we're going to do is create a user arch agent um, with this password here. So create user arch agent with password pass123. And I believe we need to put our password in single quotes here. So you can see that that created this uh, role. And then what we're going to do is grant all privileges on database archdb dev to arch agent and we get the output grant here okay so we can control d to exit here or backslash q and so now we're just back into our, norm our normal terminal um, but what we have done is actually created a new database um, in fact if we jump back into psql here and we backslash l um, we can see the different databases that we have on our system now. And so you should be able to see this archdb underscore dev database that we just created. Okay, so now I'm going to recommend that you download a very useful tool called pgadmin4. Um, so if you just google pgadmin4 or just head over to pgadmin.org, this is a really nice um, development platform for Postgres. Um, if you just take a look at some screenshots here, you can see that what it allows us to do is to run SQL um, within the application here. Um, it's got a nice GUI, and so it's a nice sort of environment to use as an alternative to just working with uh, Postgres from the command line. So if you head over to their download page and download it for whatever um, operating system that you'd like to use, uh, PG Admin 4 is actually runs within the browser and PG Admin 3, although it's no longer supported, I believe runs, um, you know, in its own sort of application window. So again, just a useful tool to have um, to interact with any of the databases uh, that you create. If you'd like an alternative to this, um, I would also definitely recommend a tool called DataGrip which is uh, provided by JetBrains. You can get a free 30-day trial of this if you don't already have a JetBrains account. Um, I'm in no way associated with JetBrains except for the fact that um, I love their products. Um, and so this is just coming um, to you as a, as a personal recommendation um, from someone who enjoys using these tools. The nice thing about DataGrip is that we can connect to other databases besides just Postgres. So MySQL or MariaDB or SQL Server um, or of course Postgres and a number of other data sources. Um, we can connect to them all in one place here using DataGrip. And this is what I'll be using um, throughout this tutorial. Um, again, if you have any particular questions about using pgadmin, I'd be happy to help there as well. Um, but once you open it and get it going, it should look pretty similar to 
um, DataGrip or any other sort of development platform for SQL. So I'm going to open up DataGrip and you can see some other databases that I have here on the left, but we're going to connect to a new PostgreSQL database and I'm just going to call this archdev and again we're on localhost port 5432 and the database that we just created was this archdb underscore dev. The user that will be working on behalf of here is archagent and then the password that we uh, created for that user we'll just fill in here. If you click test connection you should see um, that we have a successful connection again if you're using data grip here. I'm going to say OK and if we expand the database and look within um, the databases here and then within schemas and public um, this is where we will eventually see tables once we have tables in our database um, so right now we just have an empty database um, but what we do have is within Visual Studio Code in our startup class we have this um, application DB context where we'll be using the Postgres database that connects at this very connection string um, that we are looking at in our SQL platform here. So if you take a look over in our project directory and then the data subdirectory, we have this migrations folder. And this actually came over with the template, um, unfortunately, um, because this migration is specific to SQLite. So we can see um, some various references to SQLite here um, in this actual migration. So these database migrations are going to be um, used to sort of track the changes that we make to our database schema over time. And, and they're really actually pretty important. So you can see we're doing things like creating tables, um, sometimes we're dropping tables, creating columns, any type of destructive action that we're taking against a database we can capture in our database migrations. And so Entity Framework is creating this uh, C-sharp file which um, basically builds out these migrations and the various actions that they're taking on the database that we're connecting to. Um, and so what we need to do is actually delete the migrations that we had initially um, brought over in the template here. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete this folder. The next thing that I like to do in our startup class here is to actually go ahead and remove the options from uh, where we actually add identity server so that we have just a sort of vanilla identity server set up here added to our services and so then of course we call our configuration store for the uh, configure db context and I made one typo here obviously we don't need to add a configuration store again but we need to add the operational store Okay, so what we can do now is actually run our first migrations. So we have deleted the migrations uh, directory that was a subdirectory of um, data in our project. And so we can do this over at our command line. So we want to make sure that we have the Entity Framework tools available to us at the command line. Um, just to check that, we can just .NET EF and you should see this entity framework uh, with the unicorn here um, and you can see some of the commands that we can run here so we're going to be working with migrations so the first migration that we're going to run is going to set up our application db context so that's going to um, create some of the uh, tables that are required by sp.net identity um, for our application and we don't have any other um, tables in use by this particular application so we should just see those get created. So what we're going to do is call .NET EF migrations add and then we're going to name the migration whatever you'd like. I'm just calling mine initial identity migration and then we're going to specify the particular context, um, the DB context that is um, that we're talking about here. So we're talking about the application DB context first of all and then we can specify the output for where these migration files are going to be created by Entity Framework. So I'm going to place mine in data slash migrations, which is the folder that we deleted earlier, um, slash ASP.NET identity, and then application DB. So let's go ahead and run this. This should just take a few seconds, and then it's going to give us some feedback 
that um, it created um, the migrations for us. And you can also see that to undo this action, we could just EF migrations remove it if we made some mistake. So if we head over to our migrations directory now, which was recreated um, through this command, we now have this ASP.NET identity directory with an application DB subdirectory, and then we can see uh, the migrations that were created for us. Um, so the first file here is the actual migration, and the second is this designer file. Um, it's more interesting to look directly at this uh, uh, migration C# -sharp file where we can see uh, the C# -sharp code that was generated by Entity Framework to actually create these uh, ASP.NET identity um, tables for us. So you can see we're going to have a users table, some role claims, user claims, user logins, uh, user roles, um, and ASP.NET user tokens. You should also notice that the type of migration that was created is specific to um, Postgres. Um, so in fact, you can see here where um, this annotation method is called this uh, NPG SQL value generation strategy serial column defines an auto incrementing primary key column in this case for ID. So what that's going to do is just you know auto increment starting with one uh, this serial column that we have in Postgres. Okay, so we actually have two more migrations to apply, one for the uh, configuration DB context and then one for this persistent grant DB context. So let's go ahead and generate those now. So the next command that I'll run, um, go ahead and clear the screen here. So the next command that we'll run here is uh, .NET EF migrations add, and I'll call this one initial IS4 server configuration migration um, with the dash C context of configuration DB context. And the output directory for this I'll place in data migrations identity server slash configuration DB. Let's go ahead and run this. So again, this should just take a few seconds and then we'll go ahead and run the persisted grant configuration. So that just took a few seconds and now we'll go ahead and run the last migration that we need, which is our persisted grant migration um, with the persisted grant DB context, uh, DB context. And the output folder will be data migrations identity server persisted grant DB. So let's go ahead and run this. This will actually just create a single table, I believe, for persisted grants in our database. Okay, so if all of those completed successfully, um, each one should say done, and we can head once again back over to our data directory where we have our migrations, and we can see the migrations uh, specific to ASP.NET Identity. This was our application DB context and then two subdirectories under identity server for persisted grants and the configuration DB context. If we take a look at the configuration DB context uh, migration file, we can see that it's going to create a number of tables, uh, including clients, identity resources, API claims, API scopes, really anything that's needed to configure how identity server four will be working. So. Um, we'll have references to the client APIs here, um, some of their properties, uh, things like redirect URIs, scopes, in other words, the things that um, we need to sort of protect. We have client secrets, identity claims, scope claims, um, and so we'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail later on, but this is going to actually create these database tables for us. Um, likewise, in the persisted grant DB migration, we do just have this one table that's being built called persisted grants. So we have our database, we have the migrations set up in this project, and now all that we need to do is to update our database. So we can do that again with the EF tool here, .NET EF database update, and then we'll specify a context application DB context first. And so what's happened now is that Entity Framework has run the migration against our database for the application DB context migration. Um, and in fact, if we head back over into either PG admin or in my case, data grip here, if I simply refresh the database here, um, I can actually see the new tables that were just created. So we've got an ASP.NET users table, user tokens, roles, logins, um, and claims. 
And so if you've used ASP.NET Identity in the past, you'll be familiar with these tables, um, but you can see that they're provided explicitly by ASP.NET Identity. Um, and so now it's time to generate the tables that Identity Server 4 requires. So if we .NET EF database update context configuration DB context, this is going to generate the bulk of the tables that Identity Server 4 requires. Okay, and if you'd like to see those, once again, we can head back over into our SQL platform here and refresh and we can see some new tables that were generated, actually quite a few here. So things were related to the clients and the API claims that we might have. So for now, these are just empty tables, um, but they will have some data in them relatively shortly. So the next thing that we'll do is we'll go ahead and add that last table by applying that final migration here, which is our persisted grant DB context, and we'll go ahead and run this. Okay, so now that that's complete, we can head over one more time to our um, database and if we refresh our tables um, we should now see 26 tables with this persisted grants table being the last one that was generated. So I realize that there are a lot of tables here um, there's kind of a lot going on at once um, but it was important that we get this uh, sort of set up right away I think it's going to be more useful to talk about these concepts with this structure in our database in place.